Dr. Philip Richards today. He's the author of 10 books, including Shrapnel Maps, for, forthcoming to, uh, to 2020, The Sound of Listening, 2018, Send the Opera, 2015, Pictures at an Exhibition, 2016, To See the Earth, 2008, and other books. He has also translated the poetry of Arsene Tarkovsky. This translation appeared under the title, I Burned at the Peace, Selected Poems of Arsene Tarkovsky, 2015. His work book awards, the Watson Fellowship, the Creative Workforce, Fellowship and the Cleveland Arts Prize. He is professor of English and director of the Peace and Justice, uh, sorry, of the Peace, Justice and Human Rights Program at John Carroll University. I'd like to mention also that uh, after the talk and the Q and A, Dr. Richards will be signing books um, of his um, uh, a copy of his book, The Sound of Listening, um, that the lecture also will be revolving around. Please join me in welcoming him. Thank you, Sidin. Uh, thank you so much to uh, Sidin Harb and Rima Rantisi for inviting me to come here um, many, many, many years ago, uh, before you were born, before your parents were born, before their parents were born. My great, great grandparents emigrated from, uh, from Lebanon. Um, half of them were exiled and half of them were seeking their fortune. So there's a sort of strange irony that, uh, that I stand before you, um, descendant from people here, and, uh, and what brought me back was actually poetry. So never let anybody tell you that poetry doesn't ha give you wings to travel, actually. Um, because it w if it weren't for poetry, I would have never uh, been here speaking before you today. Um, maybe it would be kind of fun just to read the poem where I talk about the exile of my, uh, my great-grandfather, Skandar. Um, and then I'll go into the talk about uh, the sound of listening and the rest of it. Um, so <coughs> I think one thing that poems can do is they can honor um, our ancestors, where we come from, and um, that's something in the United States which seems somewhat uh, uh, unusual because uh, we're often a f thought of as a kind of forward-thinking, present tense people. Um, but if there's anything I learned from my, my parents, it's that, uh, that we don't emerge alone, that we are with others and from others and for others. And actually, just today, I, I drove up to the shoof to, to, to the place where he came from, and it was surreal to, to be there. Um, I, I don't know if I expected that he would be there, actually, my great-grandfather, but somehow I did. I actually felt like that, um, that I would be looking for some presence there. So this is a poem. It's called The Ballad of Skandar set in Dalamar. Unframed by any photograph, diminished by history, rehearsed in no song, embalmed in oral memory, great-grandfather, where have you gone? Under the waning moon in the valley of Dar al-Amar, Skandar ibn Mitri, Arab Christian soldier for the occupier, in the far margins of the Ottoman Empire, above a little town, a Muslim diverted the living stream. The story passes down his crops. The Christians below sent up soldier after soldier. They couldn't capture the unnamed wily Muslim until Skandar, courageous warrior, brought down the Muslim in cuffs. In the village below, Skandar fell, a bullet in his calf. The bound Muslim dragged him safe behind a cedar. Skandar gave the man his key, changed his fate forever. What would Skandar choose, jail or exile? Exile, at least, is freedom. But where is freedom? Beyond the far walls of the Ottoman Empire, 
a house without iron bars on windows where water flows from every spout, or so the story goes. And I found this, uh, this story, this is from a story that my, my parents told me, my grandfather told me, that, um, that the very person who, he, who this soldier was supposed to capture, my great-grandfather, um, became the person who saved his life. And that was just an interesting story to be told that even though we were Christians, that this Muslim was uh, essentially saved him as well. And there was something in that that uh, was a lesson to me as a young person that whatever our religion, um, we, are, we are kind of together actually. We sort of need each other in all sorts of ways. So that's that poem. So how many of you are actually writers? I'd be curious to know. Raise your hand. You identify as a writer. Okay, one, two, three, <laughs> four. Okay, <laughs> amazing. How many of you like to read poetry? Some of you, more of you, okay. I, I sort of feel like you're all poets, um, and you've convinced yourself that you're not poets, and that one of my jobs as an <laughs> evangelist for poetry is to remind you if you're um, you're part of the tribe of people who work with words, and so I want you to reclaim that for yourself. Um, everybody is clearly a poet by about, um, until about age seven, and then things kind of uh, get rational. Um, hopefully you don't get too rational too fast. There are more people coming, and there's some seats up here. You just come up. It's okay. I'll take a quick break. Come up. Come. No, it's okay. So many people thirsting for words. <laughs> uh, there's a couple more seats if you want to sit. It's okay. That's okay. I feel more relaxed if you're sitting. Uh, otherwise, it's sort of like uh, you're waiting to, to take me away at the end of the reading or something like that. Um, all right, so what I was saying is I, I, I really want you to feel as if um, that I'm not anything special up here. It's just uh, words have chosen me and I've chosen words um, in the process of many years. And there's something that is beautiful that can happen when, when you get chosen by words and when you uh, become the medium for, for words and for stories. And I hope that, that you'll do that. This book I started writing a number of years ago. I was really interested many years ago in the intersections between poets and social movements. And in the United States, I was really interested in the ways in which poets were opposing the sort of the ideas of empire and the practice of you know, exporting conflict abroad and the rest of that. So the poet's relationship to the peace movement was something that was of deep interest to me. But over the years, I realized that that, that course of study, while, while very important for me personally, I realized that I had come to poetry for the same reasons that many of you probably still read poetry. I was interested in engaging with and encountering the mystery of what it means to be alive. Um, to be in love, to wonder why it is that we die, to, um, to wonder about other worlds that are created in poetry. Um, in the very beginning of this book, it tells a story. I had a most unfortunate circumstance. I got a concussion doing laundry, um, which uh, has not absented me from doing laundry in the future. My wife's like, sorry, you stopped it. I basically hit my head in the basement and uh, I, I saw stars and, and got very dizzy and uh, went to the, to the doctor and was diagnosed with a serious concussion. Has anybody here had a concussion before? No, no concussions? You have, okay. Yeah. You, get, you get to a certain age and you're a little more prone to concussions, I think. 
In any case, it's a terrifying uh, prospect because for me as a writer, I was unable to read or write or look at screens. And uh, can you imagine not being able to look at your phone because it's uh, inducing your symptoms? In any case, so I was actually literally had to be in a dark room to reduce the stimuli to, to let my brain rest. And in the process of being in that space, unable to read and to write, I started thinking about all of the, the lines of poems that I knew and, and prayers that I knew. And, and because I was in that state of absolute distress, I, I sort of reminded, I, it sort of reminded me of what draws me actually to and why we actually need poetry in a way that sometimes we don't think we need it. And that is, um, it offers us a consolation when we are in pain, actually. It offers us a way of seeing outside of ourselves into something larger than ourselves. It offers us a hold on to some kind of beauty when things are chaotic or ugly. And that's, there's nothing kind of, um, there's nothing revolutionary about what I, what I said there. But it's that primal understanding that I kind of came back to in the process of working on this book and thinking about poetry as a refuge, actually. Poetry as a place we can go to um, maybe to heal ourselves in some sense from whatever is happening to us in the world. So I'm going to read a little bit from the intro and read a little bit from a chapter and, uh, and then maybe read a couple poems and offer some time for questions. So, um, I, it's, it's so funny, like just standing here before you, and I'll just say like personally, I don't really know what your realities are, and I feel very um, uh, humbled by, um, you know, speaking about my reality, but not knowing if it's going to connect up with your reality at all. So I, I hope that it does, and if it doesn't, then you can, um, you can excoriate me later on. Uh, so... We need refuge, a place to be fully immersed in self-forgetful joy if we want to resist injustice and oppression for the balance of our lives. Beside my bed in the dark, Rebecca Solnit's hope in the dark lay a symbol of itself. Joy can be, in Solnit's world, words, a fine initial act of insurrection. We believe our age to be one of crisis, perhaps one of the worst ages, in this, it resembles every other age. We're afflicted with the illness of presentism, inflamed by digital media. Yes, it's true there are real crises, global climate change, war and terrorism, racial oppression, predatory capitalism, sexual violence. But crisis thinking may itself be a sort of concussed thinking, causing us to fling ourselves at the latest distraction and lose our reason and empathy. Our empire and its echo chambers have made us terrified of terror, forgetful of our own histories of violence, and forgetful of our need, own need for peace. This thing about joy, just to t sell, tell an anecdote, um, a cousin of mine, I was asking her some stories. She's a little older than me, so she lived through the, the war. And I said, uh, did you have fun? She was a teenager, you know, in the 70s and 80s. I said, you must have like, had fun. She said, of course we had fun, she said. Um, this was one of the stories she told. We would have parties in the, um, in the shelters. You know, we turned the music up really loud and we danced. And then sometimes you know, to go to someone else's shelter, we would, uh, we would dress up and put on our tennis shoes. And then we would cross the street all at once to the car. And then when we were in the car, we would change into our heels and then go to the party or whatever. She said, we would cross the street all at once because if you crossed one person after another, the sniper would see you and the first time he would recognize and the second time he would get ready and the third person would be shot. So we all ran together and then we ran to, she said it was absolutely crazy, but, uh, but it was important for us to have fun, to have uh, joy in the midst of uh, conflict. So thank God that that's, that's not the reality right now. In that dark room, nursing my head, poetry was a refuge, a way to return to myself, to remember other people who had suffered as I was suffering. Um, this book tries to prov uh, provide a context for a poetics of resistance and refuge that predates the Trump age and will be necessary long after it. 
In order to survive such moments, we need to glean the present and past for what might sustain us for the work ahead. Um, this book actually came out of a previous book called Behind the Lines, which staked a claim for the cultural work a poem can perform, from providing refuge to embodying resistance, from recovering silenced voices to imagining and modeling a more just and peaceful wor world. Rather than delivering judgments about poetic taste, these essays are experiments and questioning. I seek to claim spaces for both tactical poetry and strategic poetry, as Thomas McGrath once turned them. For McGrath, tactical poems are often ephemeral works keyed to immediate events without falling into political slogans, while strategic poems expand consciousness untethered to a specific cultural or political moment, yet inv invite us to change. So while some of the essays in this book further explore the intersections between poetry and resistance, others inquire into movements into contemporary poetry that draw upon the world, such as documentary poetics, or literally draw on the world, as in graffiti poetry, landscape poetry, installation poetry, or draw us out into the world, as in translation and Arab American poetry and cosmopoetics. While I've always been interested in the idea of poetry as a form of, or of resistance, I continue to return the idea that poetry actually is fundamentally a kind of resistance itself that is anti-rhetorical, a state anterior to politics. Poetry is a ground of opening into the possible, a refuge. The, re the reason for my shift in sort of thinking about wanting to move past resistance has to do with the American context. For those of you who know um, the Democratic Party and people on the sort of left side of the political spectrum adopted the term resistance as a sort of uh, a meme almost. And uh, it seemed preposterous to me because resistance, um, well, there's armed resistance and that's something very specific and that's not what it was. It's more, it's dissent, it's not resistance actually. Um, and so I got really uh, disenchanted with the idea that, uh, with, with the term resistance itself, it seemed to completely inappropriately used. And um, so I wanted to focus a little bit more on this idea of uh, poems as anterior to politics, as a resistance to a simplified ideological um, sort of articulations. Um, the longer, and this is also comes out of my own experience, the longer I read and write poetry, the more I'm interested in um, its irreducibility. That is to say, how it can't be summoned for mere political or ideological uh, ends. Great poems seem great to me because something about them turns toward the ineffable. That is to say, this mystery which can't be articulated in words. Great poems may confound or delight, teach or provoke, but they are great because their forms vibrate and resonate beyond political platforms, slogans, or formulae. So um, it is true that some poets do a good job knocking us about, challenging and provoking, and others um, try to provide an alternate view of the world. I'm thinking of Poets like Amiri Barak, Ma, uh, Baraka, Mahmoud Darwish, Bob Dylan, June Jordan, Adrian Rich, Fadi Juda, Salmaj Sharif, Denez Smith, among others. But poets are both scourgers and healers. They provide both sting and balm. And our vocation is to, uh, to quote Mother Jones, to afflict the comfortable and comfort the afflicted. Does that make sense? to afflict the comfortable, and to comfort the afflicted. So there's a lot more I can say here, um, but you know, why poetry? What, what can poetry tell us or give us at this point? Seamus Heaney once famously said, no lyric has ever stopped a tank. But we don't know the futures our poems create. Part of the problem is that change is not always visible. We rarely know if a poem uh, that someone read led them to oppose a war, or protect a victim of sexual violence, or protest a pipeline cutting through native land. But the arts are a part of technologies of consciousness change, often solitary, occasionally communal, and their work is mostly unseen. In this way, poetry and the arts resemble grassroots activism. 
as Rebecca Solnit notes in an essay, most environmental victories look like nothing happened. The land wasn't annexed by the army, the mine didn't open, the road didn't cut through, the factory didn't spew effluence, they didn't give asthma to the children who didn't wheeze and panic and stay indoors on beautiful days. They are triumphs invisible except by storytelling. We need writers, and I hope some of you in this room will become those writers, to mark those moments and those places to tell us the history that is yet to be told. There's a poem that I'll share with you now by William Stafford. It's called, At the Unnational Monument Along the Canadian Border. So he's talking about a space where there's no monument, but he's sort of imagining that there ought to be a monument, so he makes one with his words at the unnational monument along the Canadian border. This is the field where the battle did not happen, where the unknown soldier did not die. This is the field where grass joined hands, where no monument stands, and the only heroic thing is the sky. Birds fly here without any sound, unfolding their wings across the open, no people killed or were killed on this ground, hallowed by neglect and an air so tame that people celebrate it by forgetting its name. Stafford's poem bears the sting of poignancy. He knows that the peace that has been won is so much more easily forgotten than the war and its blood sacrifice. Yet the poem becomes its own monument to this place where no stone markers need to commemorate those killed by war. The ripple effect of a good poem is the opposite of a bomb's concussion wave. It buoys us in its bracing music, whatever hurt it bears, holding us momentarily aloft, helping us to stand our ground, providing us a spark to make our way in the general dark. So that's a little bit about the kind of the overarching vision of the book. And e each chapter, I'm sort of looking at um, an aspect or element of American poetry that sort of drew my attention. Um, something called documentary poetry, which is poems that are incorporating news sources and, and uh, ethnographic materials and voices. Um, has anybody read any documentary poetry in here? Who's familiar with the term documentary poetry? It's kind of a hot new term in, in poetry. Um, it's, uh, I don't know, it's, it's, it's the Beyonce of, of poetry at this point, so you should figure it out. Um, also, uh, um, looking at some Arab American poets, um, some po poems that are written actually in public spaces, like graffiti kinds of poems, installation poetry. Um, there's a section in here on uh, peace poetry of which the William Stafford poem would be part. And then there's individual chapters. Adrian Rich, I did a, a, a piece on Adrian Rich. Um, Khalil Gibran, who's actually supposed to be a, um, a close family, a member of the f our family in the, in the north. And um, I could read a little bit of that. How are we doing for time? OK, should I read a little bit from that section? or? Would you guys like to hear poems or me reading a little bit of the book? How many people want to hear poems? Okay, poems. All right, we'll read some poems. Can you read us part of the peace poems? The peace poems, yes, absolutely, thank you. Um, one of the things that uh, fascinates me about the intersection between poetry and, and peace is that um, one of the very first poems that was ever written was by the first poem we poet we know by name. Her name was Enheduanna, and she was a Sumerian priestess. This is uh, back in Sumer, so 4,000 years ago. Uh, she wrote a poem that was a lament against the spirit of war. So from the beginning of human history and the beginning of our cultures, beginning of civilization, we've lamented this thing. That we, that we do to each other. Um, and that struck me so powerfully that I thought, you know, of course, like Homer and the Iliad, that there's this great um, 
sort of glorification of war and heroism and courage and valor and the rest of it. But there's also this counter tradition of poets who are um, saying that, that, that war is the worst of us as well. Um, and so that sort of thinking about that was, was part of it. So I'll read a little bit of that. I don't even know my own book. Isn't that sad? Uh, you write it and then you put it away. Okay. So in English, the word peace um, is a very abstract. It has no feeling and meaning. Um, and this is a problem. Because war has all of these connotations, feelings, fragrances, um, images. Peace seems like completely abstract. Our lexicon for peacemaking is poor, not because we have no experience of peace or peacemaking, but because the language of violence of war has been ubiquitous in our culture and enormously profitable for those in power. And with the mightiest military in the history of the world, and perhaps the most adaptable empire, we live under conditions that Paul Virilio calls pure war, a state in which the endless preparation for war constitutes the real war. We need to realize the dim lands of peace, as Ezra Pound once called them, however dim they may seem at first. Though our poetry has ably represented the traumatic and unmaking operations of war, from the rage of Achilles to our present, it has also unwittingly glorified and perpetuated a culture of war. So we have yet to give adequate attention to how our poetry also contains the seeds of other ways of dealing with conflict, oppression, injustice, and how it may advance our thinking in, into what a future without war might look like. So a poem for you. There's a few that I could read here. This is a poem by Muriel Rukeyser, a uh, Jewish American poet, a socialist. Um, she actually volunteered for the Spanish Civil War to sort of protect the, the, the democratic element against the fascists there. But this is written sort of toward the end of her life when she's trying to imagine a network of people who are trying to create this other way of being that I hope that poetry can instantiate. The poem is called Poem. Mm -hmm. Now this was written 50 years ago, but some of it will sound really hauntingly uh, contemporary. I lived in the first century of world wars. Most mornings I would be more or less insane. The news would pour out of various devices. The newspapers would arrive with their careless stories interrupted by attempts to sell products to the unseen. I would call my friends on other devices. They would be more or less mad for similar reasons. Slowly, I would get to pen and paper, make my poems for others unseen and unborn. In the day, I would be reminded of those men and women, brave, setting up s signals across vast distances, considering a nameless way of living of almost unimagined values. As the lights darkened, as the lights of night brightened, we would try to imagine them, try to find each other, to construct peace, to make love, to reconcile waking with sleeping, ourselves with each other, ourselves with ourselves. We would try by any means to reach the limits of ourselves, to reach beyond ourselves, to let go the means, to wake. I lived in the first century of these wars. So that's a poem from that section. <laughs> I love that poem. And the devices, right? Did you think, there weren't cell phones when she wrote that poem? Yeah. What sort of devices is she talking about? All of our devices. Um, does anybody know the, the name Naomi Shihab Nye? She has a poem called Jerusalem that I like quite a bit that's in here. Um, where's dear Naomi's poem? Uh, 
I actually have an argument with the beginning of this poem, and maybe some of you might too, but, um, but it's an attempt to create a kind of spirit. It's called Jerusalem, and Naomi, is, uh, her father was a Palestinian who uh, was a refugee. Jerusalem. I'm not interested in who suffered the most. I'm interested in people getting over it. Once when my father was a boy, a stone hit him on the head. Hair would never grow there. Our fingers found the tender spot and its riddles. The boy who has fallen stands up. A bucket of pears in his mother's doorway welcomes him home. The pears are not crying. Lately, his friend who threw the stone says he was aiming at a bird, and my father starts growing wings. Each carries a tender spot, something our lives forgot to give us. A man builds a house and says, I am native now. A woman speaks to a tree in place of her son, and olives come. A child's poem says, I don't like wars, they end up with monuments. He's painting a bird with wings wide enough to cover two roofs at once. Why are we so monumentally slow? Soldiers stalk a pharmacy, big guns, little pills. If you tilt your head just slightly, it's ridiculous. There's a place in this brain where hate won't grow. I touch its riddles, wind and seeds. Something pokes us as we sleep. It's late but everything comes next. So, you know, I have an argument a little bit with the beginning of this poem. You know, I said, like, I'm not interested in who suffered the most. I'm interested in getting over it. Yeah, but we do need to make an account of history also. The justice side of me says, hang on a second, Naomi. But uh, the peace side of me says, and yet, and yet, we can talk all day about history, but how do we find each other again? Um, someone once famously said, uh, most of the violence in the world happens because we've forgotten that we belong to each other. Okay, so, I don't know, maybe, do you want me to read something from South Africa? Okay. Some, like what? I don't know, I, mean, I was wondering whether I could ask you to read because it's so visual. It is, it is visual, okay. So I don't know how much of your performance will, will give us a sense of what's on the page. Yes. Okay. I won't read the... Well, okay. <laughs> well, some of them are not that visual. Right. Do you guys know who uh, Barney the dinosaur is? Yes. Yeah. Everyone knows <laughs> Everyone knows Barney. Okay. So this is a poem I wrote um, when there was a man uh, who... Um, was in a, well, he was in Guantanamo for the most part, but he was rendered, he was taken, he was uh, considered a terrorist. And I read about his case. Um, his name is Mohamedou Oud Salahi. Have you heard of him? He actually published a book the same year this book came out called Guantanamo Diary, his memoir of being in the prison. Um, and I had read about his case before the the, his book came out, and um, I wanted to write a poem for him and to remember him as he stood in that or was in that prison, um, never accused, never convicted of a crime, but nonetheless was uh, languishing there for 13, 14 years. And so I would read this poem, and um, I learned that he was subjected to certain uh, kinds of torture. And the torture was quite devious. Of course, any torture is devious in its own way, but this devious torture was devious because it, it didn't um, impact, it didn't imprint physically on his body. They had music that they played for 24-7, you know, all day, all night, for days and days and days. And if you've ever stayed up, how many people have stayed up for an all-nighter? How about two nights in a row? Wow, three nights? After three or four nights, you start to go psychotic. And this is actually what they were doing to prisoners. And, um, and they weren't playing like 
you know, devilish music. They were playing things like the um, Sesame Street theme song, Sunny Days, and the, Bar the Barney theme song. And I thought that was so sinister and wanted to write a poem for Muhammadu and, uh, and to indict, I guess, in some ways, us, myself, and anybody who um, lives in a society that condones or is silent about this kind of uh, detention. So I'm going to try to sing, and I can't sing, so it'll be, but just bear with me. <coughs> For Muhammadu Utslahi. In the cell of else, in the pitch white, someone's hands shackled between ankles in the nights and sunny days, keeping the clouds, shaking the rib cage, and no way to keep the music from entering and breaking the bodies hit. Let the bodies hit. Barney is a dinosaur. This is the touching without being touched. This is the being without silence. From our imagination, in wave upon wave, in a shipping container, and I love you in a box of shock, you love me in a cemented dream. We're a happy family with a great big hug and chains that leave no mark. Won't you say you love me too? Yeah. So, the, thanks. <laughs> the amazing thing about his story is I would read this poem almost every time I gave a reading because I was so enraged by the injustice of it. Uh, his book came out in 2015, and uh, there was so much pressure placed upon the government because of the really beautiful story he told in that book about someone who you know, was not the person they thought he was, um, that he, he, was, he was eventually let go. And now he's in Mauritania, and we're, we're following each other on Twitter, and I told him about the poem and stuff, and it was, it's surreal. We live in a surreal world, but that's one of the powers, I think, of words. Um, so never stop trying to tell your stories. Um, and maybe I'll read one for um, an Iraqi woman who is this wonderful cook that uh, she wrote a book um, called Delights from the Garden of Eden. And then I'll maybe I'll read one more and then we'll have time for questions. So there's a wonderful museum. If you ever had a chance to go to the United States, it's called the Arab American National Museum. And uh, we occasionally have um, gatherings, conferences, there was a, a conference of Arab American writers. Can you believe that we exist? It's so strange. <laughs> I, um, I don't believe it, actually. Uh, so we were, we, there was a great reading that was happening in the basement of this museum. And uh, some of you uh, may know Fadl al-Zawi. He's, he's a poet from Iraq that uh, was in exile for 50 years, probably. He has this wonderful poem called Toasts, which I should probably read to you, but I'm not sure I can find it right away. But look it up. It's, it's online. He's basically toasting all the absurdities of the universe. Um, and he was r reciting this poem, and uh, Khaled Matawa was uh, translating it, and all of us were in this basement just loving this thing that was happening, this communion that was happening. And next to me was uh, a couple that I had met in graduate school who um, had come from Mosul and Baghdad. And uh, she, she's a, just this incredibly intelligent um, chef and writer. She, she write, writes these books. And the other guy, um, is a, now he's a professor. And um, so I was just thinking about her and, and what it's like to be in exile and to, through food, actually find a way to sort of recover home, I guess. So this is a toast for Nawal Nasrallah. The last thing I'll say is right above us, there was a, a, a wedding party happening. So it was quite surreal to hear the tables and chairs being moved. Um, a toast for Nawal Nasrallah. Chair legs screech across the banquet floor above us. 
a wedding feast of people pulling themselves closer, closer to the constellation of tables, while here, underground, alone with our ears, we can't get close enough to Alzawi reciting a toast. And laughter in two languages marinates the hunger of this room. And now you lean to hear him, who has not lived in your homeland for most of his days on earth. Like, like you who have lived your country in kitchens far from your country, testing the tastes of the ancients, citizen of this implacable state and its armies, pitching their permanent tent in the dictator's palaces. You who out of grief's maw, the daily shipwreck of news, translate the alien clay of cuneiform relief into Mesopotamian stews. A toast to you, Nawal, at whose Mesopotamian table I have been honored to sit and be sated, not with fried eggplant, but buran, not with drumsticks baked in fig, but with afkhad al dijaj biltin, your homeland transfigured by flame, Baghdad now spiced with coriander, now stewed in its skin. A toast to you, for my insides still sing, and now the people above us are dancing. They cannot help themselves. They are wrapping themselves in a song, stuffed like grape leaves. They have no room for us in the light. So below, in our root cellar of words, here in the underland of exile, a toast to you, the country of your tongue. Okay. Well, should we have time for questions? So thank you. Shukran. And now we're starting. We are starting <laughs> now. <laughs> yes? Um, I had a question about a couple of your poems in Sand Opera. Okay. Um, so, um, there are two poems titled Blues of Text. And I was wondering if um, there was intertext with W. E. Chauden, so like Roman Empire blues. Oh, he wrote a bunch of blueses, didn't he? He did. And it was not intentional. I felt like there were like there were similar similar tones and I mean they're both about I mean the the, the Roman wall blues is um, is is also you know a a, a pawn in in a, in a giant empire I, I it just kind of I think you have a paper to write actually the similarities just <laughs> like seemed really blatant so I was just wondering yeah yeah. Uh, no, absolutely not intentional. But, uh, but the blues is obviously a, a, a deeply evocative tradition of people enduring circumstances beyond their control. And uh, the, a well-known poet, Salma Sharif, had actually criticized my employing this term to, to describe soldiers in their predicament. She, she called it a form of pink washing. And I'll just say that um, soldiers are in a predicament. Um, I'm not justifying them. I don't consider them victims. But uh, they are in a predicament um, often of things beyond their control. And that's, that's why I was drawn to this idea. It's a very you know, American form, in a sense. And in fact, one of the soldiers is an African American. And so it, it, um, thinking about his own experience as a person, a minority person who's fighting for this state in another country, um, it just struck me as a, as, a, as a kind of modality that I wanted to, to, to bring to, that, to his words. Um, but Auden is, is great. Adam and I are just drawing on that, I, that, quite, that, that sort of turns to music. Yeah. Um, you spent a lot of time talking about other people's stories and how important it was to recognize them and to talk about them. But you didn't spend so much time talking about your own. Are yeah. there any parts, significant parts of your life that influenced your work heavily? Thank you. Um, I mean, this, the, the book is called The Sound of Listening partly because I'm thinking through the idea of the poet as a sort of medium for other people's voices. And so there was maybe a, a little bit of an intentionality to say, like, I don't want to just have my work simply tell my story, but to, to draw upon the, the great human story of which 
we're all part. Um, I mean, I've written many poems that are about my own story, but actually this book, interestingly, is mostly sort of about me as the medium for these other stories. In the very middle, there's a bunch of poems about what it's like to be a parent during a time of war. And um, so those are um, very much thinking through my own personal experience, standing in the ground of my experience, trying to find the balance as parents try to find between protecting their children from the world and also exposing them in ways to prepare them for the world and trying to figure out what the ideal of that is and, and failing all the time to figure out what exactly is the best. Um, because if you merely protect, you suffocate. If you merely expose, you, um, you don't provide them with the, bound, the structured boundaries of love, which flourishing kind of requires. So um, I had a conversation with my daughter where I knew, actually, it's the end of that section where I knew that she had internalized a sense of her own resources for dealing with suffering. And this is that poem. So this is for you. Um, well, it's also about her, too, so it's not just about me. But insofar as her children are always about us, <laughs> it's about me, too. Um, I had asked her a question. I'm not going to tell you what the question is because it's more interesting just to hear her talk. What does it mean, I say? She says, it means to be quiet just by yourself. She says, there's a treasure chest inside. You get to dig it out. Somehow, it's spring. She says, will it always rain? In some countries, I say, they're praying for rain. She asks, why do birds sing? In the dream, my notebook dipped in water, all the writing lost. Says, read the story again. But which one? That which diverts the mind is poetry. Says, you know those planes that hit those buildings? Asks, why do birds sing? When the storm ends, she stops, holds her hands together, closes her eyes. What are you doing? I'm praying for the dead worms. Says, listen. That's it. <laughs> yeah. Right. right, this is the Tarjumat question, so it, it's translations finally come around, yeah. Um, so you're asking about, partly about Americans. I think translation is essential, it's vital, it's crucial. Um, I've spent, like I spent today with a man who knew some English and I knew a tiny bit of Arabic, and uh, we need us to be able to understand each other in terms of our languages. And translation is a, um, is one way to do that. Now, your bigger question is, do, would, are, do America, are Americans interested, do they care about what Arabs think, what their worlds are like? And um, yeah, I think there, there are plenty that do. There are plenty that do. Like everywhere, people are distracted, they're suffering their own specific pains, and so figuring out what's happening in the world is sometimes very difficult for people. I mean, think about your own reality, how sometimes hard it is to hear anybody else's reality. Um, there's a wonderful short essay by my friend Fadi Juda. It's, um, uh, say it, I'm Arab and beautiful. And uh, it's a simple kind of articulation, a uh, clarion call, but he says um, that it's a radical thought still to, um, to, say, to say that sentence, and um, that he wants to be about beauty, actually, um, in terms of his own project. Sometimes the, a bind that Arab Americans get into is trying to communicate a reality of the suffering of others in a way that um, people 
challenges people in ways that are very hard to, to hear. And what Fatty says is, you know, like, um, those who, will hear, who want to hear will hear, and those who don't want to hear will not hear. And we shouldn't try to be convincing anyone of anything, actually. We should be um, creating truthful and beautiful um, versions of, our, of reality. Um, I think that things happening in the United States in terms of the Middle East are really fluid right now in a good way, a positive way. And when, when Ilan Omar says, criticizes um, the APAC and the role of the lobby, Israel lobby is like, she's saying things that uh, has not, have not been said in the, in the halls of power. Um, so so there's, there are things happening and the young I teach a course called Israeli and Palestinian Literature, for example. When I started 12 years ago, I would have said maybe two-thirds were sort of more, I mean, in, in, in the most passive of ways, would have been two-thirds would have been more positive toward the Israeli story and one-third maybe the Palestinian story. Now it's totally reversed, actually, for young people. And my challenge as a teacher is to challenge them, whoever, whatever point of view you have, to at least understand why conflict, the conflict happened and what its consequences are and, and whether there are any ways out. So um, as a teacher, there's always something to teach, but I think that younger people have a much different I sense of the Middle East and, and what is causing conflict. And um, so, yes, yeah, interesting time. But the role of the writer and the role of the translator is, again, not to convince, but to create a living archive of our truths as we understand them. Of course, I'll be trying to convince, but I just, you know, that's just my own weakness. Yeah. Well, you know, there's a, a, a roundtable that's coming out shortly where Zain al Sus actually talks about 9 11. And so 9 11 induced in Americans a real, and this is back to that original question, a real interest in what was happening. Because when you, you know, when those planes hit those buildings, most people weren't thinking about the Middle East or weren't thinking about Al Qaeda or any of that. And so they, uh, a certain readership turned their attention to trying to understand. The question they brought sometimes was limited. Why do they hate us? But there was also all the other questions. How could this have happened? And so there was a space that opened up for um, a number of writers and writings that didn't exist before, which is sad to me. Does it take, uh, you know, planes get, you know, like people being killed for people to <laughs> wake up to um, the realities? So uh, for many of us, like for myself at least, I wanted to not be silent at a time when people w might be miscategorizing the situations that exist. So... That was, very, that was a very pivotal moment for me to say, you know, I need to say something because my silence becomes complicity otherwise. So, yeah. Okay, on this note, actually, I'd like to thank you. Okay, and thank, thank you. Thank you for the question. Thank you so much, guys. Copies of Dr. Lucius's book. Can I start with what I have to go to class? Yeah. Yeah.